Welcome everybody to Bird Adaptations. We'll be getting started in just a few more minutes. Just gonna let people sign in. If you have any questions or uh, comments, you can, um, if you're watching through Zoom, there are some buttons on the control panel to open up the question and answer or the chat. And if you're watching through YouTube, please feel free to use the chat function to ask us something. Welcome everybody to Bird Adaptations. We'll be starting in one minute. Um, please feel free to use the chat windows if you have any questions or need any assistance. All right, welcome everybody to Bird Adaptations. Uh, we're going to get started now. And if you have any questions, please make use of the chat functions. Uh, I'll be happy to help you and answer questions um, when we can. We are going to go live now to uh, Jade down at Maine Wildlife Park in Gray. Hello, good morning everyone. My name is Jade and I'm an educator for the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And today we are at the Maine Wildlife Park in Gray, which is part of the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And here at the park, we have a lot of different types of Maine native wildlife. We have black bears, moose, different owls, snakes, turtles, bobcats, beavers, and a lot more. And all the animals that are here are here because they were either orphaned 
or injured, and in some cases, even illegal pets um, that are then human dependent. So all the animals here at the park cannot live out in the wild on their own, so they are living here. And if you want to learn more about the park, you can go to mainewildlifepark.com. Today I am in our Backyard Birds is exhibit because we are talking about birds and their amazing adaptations. Birds are a group of animals that fill so many different roles in nature. So different bird species can be predators, scavengers, omnivores, insectivores, and pollinators. And it all started millions of years ago with a small reptile and some feathers. So there are many types of birds in Maine, and I'm sure you've seen some of them. And just to name a few, we have corvids like our American crow, common raven and blue jays, the Atlantic puffin, the great blue heron, um, different woodpeckers, flickers, pileated, um, different hummingbirds, our loons, bluebirds, chickadees, all kinds of raptors, and that's just to name a few. So we will talk more about these different birds. So feathers made it all possible for us to have this diverse group of animals that we have in the birds. And these feathers keep them warm. They allow them to fly and swim. And feathers first started on dinosaurs as a way to thermoregulate and that means that they are keeping themselves warm. So they also use those feathers for different displays to other dinosaurs. And over generations, they develop the ability to first glide and eventually fly. And there are more feathers, the more feathers they had on their body, the warmer that they were. They could stay out in colder weather. And when they were able to fly, they could hunt differently and spread out geographically. So through evolution and generations of adapting to different habitats and different diets, we now have many types of birds. One of the most ancient types of birds that we have has been around for millions of years, and that is the loon. The earliest loons are from 65 million years ago, and our modern loons lineage goes back to 35 million years ago. And loons are designed for swimming, they are really great divers. They can stay underwater for up to three minutes, but they usually dive for less than one minute. And they have very powerful back webbed feet and very sleek waterproof feathers that help them in that uh, water environment. And they return to Maine freshwater when the ponds and lake ice moves out in the spring. You can hear loons in the springtime when they're setting up their nest territories. And if you listen, we have a loon call. I'm sure you've maybe heard around our main lakes and ponds. That, that signature like yodel sound that comes from the loons. And they also have, I have a um, model loon here and you can see this very strong pointed beak, the bill of their beak, is for catching fish. So they dive and they swim through the water and then they use this super pointed long beak to catch fish. And all birds have two layers of feathers on their body. The first one is this downy layer for warmth. It's very lightweight. All their feathers are very lightweight, so they don't have to carry too much weight when they're flying. And this layer is closest to their skin. It's very soft and fluffy. And these small feathers have a loose fluffy structure and that allows them to create pockets of air on the bird and those pockets of air warm their body. So this is just like our down blankets and jackets so that we can also be warm without all the weight of fur. So those um, downy feathers can't create pockets on their own. If it was just that, the birds wouldn't stay warm enough. Um, so they also have feathers called contour feathers. And this is a contour feather and you can see still some of this downy feather filament at the bottom. And here at the top, 
these are the kinds of feathers that are going to cover the bird's body and it gives them their sleek shape and it also creates some weatherproofing from the wind, rain, and cold. So this is the shell of the jacket. So this down part is going to be the base layer and then the contour feathers are that shell of the jacket. And ducks have very special contour feathers. Their um, feathers keep them waterproof and it's like a, the best raincoat. And they use their beaks and they rub a special oil that they produce from a gland close to their tail. And that oil covers their whole body, all their body feathers. So water doesn't soak through. So the oil repels the water off of their bodies. Birds also have feathers um, for attracting mates and of course to help them fly. So here I have a great horned owl wing and if I get a little bit closer you can see it has a lot of different types of feathers and this allows them to lift up into the air and glide and they also have hollow um, bones and those feathers are really lightweight. So they're light, but they're really, really strong. I don't know if you could see too, at the, these top feathers are different and then they transition to all different types of feathers for maneuvering and flying. And this is a flight feather. And this has an asymmetrical shape, which means it's not symmetrical. So both sides have different um, growth on both sides. And this helps create lift as well and the curved shape of the wing from underneath. So just like a plain wing, we learned that from birds to design those plain wings. That same shape of the flight feathers and wings. But of course they're not just for flight. So feathers are a thing of beauty. Birds have a lot of different ways to attract mates. Some of them sing songs and some of them do um, dances or displays with their feathers in their bodies and through different songs, nest building, dancing and bright colored feathers, they can attract their mates. So here's some different examples of birds that do those unique behaviors, have beautiful coloration, and a very popular song here in Maine, that's the robin singing. One of the most common songs we probably hear in the springtime right now outside around our yards. So one of the most iconic feathers, I think, are peacock feathers. And these are very much for display. This feather is not gonna be helping this bird blend in and camouflage the males, so the peacocks, have these feathers and they use them to attract mates. They fluff them and fan them out and they ruffle and shake them to try and get the girls to like them. And turkeys in the spring, they do displays and they do singing. And here we have a picture of two male turkeys and they have all their feathers out on display. They have those little beards are what we call them. And those are the feathers that hang from the front of them. And they will fight um, other males for mates. And they also get big and fancy looking for the females. I have a turkey tail fan here. And you can see up close, it's very intricate and complicated. There's a lot of different types of feathers and patterns, and that's really important for them to help find a mate. Another bird that uh, the males will display their feathers are hummingbirds. So they have some beautiful coloration. A lot of most birds, especially our songbirds, the males are gonna be a lot brighter and flashier to attract the females. And hummingbirds will display, fight, and they'll chase competitors out of nesting territory. And the, another bird is the red-winged blackbird. And not their fe feathers aren't just useful for attracting mates, but also 
the wing bars on that on that wing of the red wing blackbird they have these colorful patches that are hidden until they want to display them and that's for dominance or for a mate so you can see on the one picture those colors aren't as flashy they kind of have them tucked behind their darker feathers but then the other one where he's trying to display them he has those feathers showing more and they display in a lot of different ways to attract their mate. And some will do it every year and some mate for life. And even those pairs that are mated for life, they'll still go through their different routines, the singing or the dancing to maintain their bond. So even after they've already found each other, they'll, they'll do that seasonally to uh, make their bond even stronger. Ravens and crows are very smart birds with a large vocabulary of calls. And sometimes a pair or family will have a special dialect or calls of their own. And they form very tight family units, uh, uh, often the generations living in the same neighborhood, and they share knowledge with each other about the best and worst, worst places for food, and they even help each other raise their young. And raven pairs um, will have strong bonds with each other, and they don't tolerate their young to linger too close once they are full grown. I also have a bird's nest here. So this is a robin's nest. Robins like to build their nests with grasses and mud. So this has is almost completely made up of different grasses and this mud bowl in the center. And they sing these songs and everything to attract their mate and lay eggs. So they have their ba having their babies is very heavy. And of course, a bird needs to fly. So they can't carry their baby around with them when they're trying to fly. So that's why birds lay eggs in a nest. And there are a lot of different kinds of nests. Some are reused year after year, and sometimes they uh, rebuild their nest every year. And they're able to make their nests using their beaks and their feet. They don't have hands like we do, of course. So they're using their feet and their beaks to weave and make those nests. And they can be made out of mud, grass, sticks, feathers, fur, um, and sometimes it's just in the sand or on the open ground. And birds also use their beaks to eat and they eat many different things and each group of birds has their own unique adaptations. So many have different beaks and different ways of getting food and some might look similar, but their different techniques and behaviors um, our, our strength, so it's like strength and it's in the details. And we'll look back at our loon beak here. That very sharp pointed beak for grabbing at fish. We have some other pictures too. So birds like woodpeckers, they have special adaptations for getting into the trees and getting the little insects and worms that live inside the trees. Hummingbirds, they have special beaks that are long and pointed also, but they reach into flowers for nectar. And then I also have here a hawk model. And we can see from their beak, it is very sharp and curved. And they use that to rip apart meat. And they'll also use their talons this is a small hawk, this is a sharp shinned hawk. We can see those talons too for helping them eat and grab onto their prey. And another unique beak is a duck's bill. And these bills are designed for scraping and scooping up water plants, bugs, and they have very um, fine serration at the edge. And that is like a strainer so they can keep the food in their mouth, but all the water drains out. And we have, a we have an activity that you can actually try some of these um, different beak adaptations at home. So we'll have that posted on the site um, later, but right now I'm gonna give an example of just a couple of these. So this, exact this activity is called Bird Beak Buffet. And I have two different types of food in different habitats. So these are, worms in dirt. And then I also have this wetland, this Tupperware with water. And I'm gonna put just a few pieces of dry pasta in my wetland. 
And then I have two different beaks. So I have these forceps, these tweezers here, and I have a slotted spoon. So these are my different bird beaks. So of course we don't want the water, we don't want the dirt, we just want the food that's inside. So when I try to pick up these worms with the spoon, I'm getting a lot of dirt and I lost my worm too. But then when I use this beak, I can pick up just the worm and none of that dirt. And then when I go over to the wetlands, I can try this pointed beak and it works well for picking up pasta and not getting very much water. And the slotted spoon also picks up pasta and not very much water. So you try this at home with different little utensils and um, things you just find around your house and in your kitchen. All of these things I just found around my house. So it's a really fun activity and we'll have that um, written up so you have the instructions and different tips and pointers for doing that activity at home. I would love to answer any questions that anyone has about bird adaptations that we've talked about. So we did get a few questions today and please uh, write in some more questions if you have them, but we're gonna start with this very fun one, which is what is your favorite kind of bird? So that's a very tricky question. People ask me all the time what my favorite animal is or what my favorite kind of bird is. And I think it changes every day. Um, here in this exhibit, we have robins, crows, grackle, morning doves, and a sap sucker. And I think my favorite in here is the, um, the sap sucker. I love watching him climb up and down. Um, they go like vertically along the sides of the trees and they peck and they get the different sugars and bugs and things like that in the tree. So I love watching him do that here in the exhibit. He's probably my favorite today. All right, and we had a couple other questions. Uh, one question is, so every, every bird has some lightweight feathers that help them fly, is that true? Sorry, I got cut off on the first part of the question. Uh, the question is, do every, does every kind of bird have lightweight feathers so they can fly? No, so not even all birds fly. Um, some birds' feathers are adapted for a different um, way of living, so, Birds like a penguin are going to have very different feathers because they live a very different um, environment and in a different um, way. So they're going to have feathers that might be a little bit denser and heavier, and they're really focused on waterproofing and weatherproofing to keep themselves warm. But those feathers aren't for flight because penguins don't fly. So all different feathers for all different types of environments and, and diets and all that different stuff. Yes, and to add to that, that all feathers are fairly light in comparison to fur, um, which is one of the reasons they, they did evolve on birds. But yeah, there, there's all different kinds of feathers. On that same note, another question was, why are the female Baltimore Orioles such different colors from the brightly oranged males? Yeah, so um, they're another one of those birds that they're gonna be doing some different mating behaviors. So the males in a lot of different bird species are always brighter than the females. So like a male cardinal or a Baltimore, Baltimore Oriole is gonna have very bright flashy colors and that is to catch the eye of the female. The females are often um, more neutral colors. They might be brown or gray or blend in with their habitat more. And part of that is that the um, female bird is going to be the one doing most of the nesting in a lot of those situations. So they don't want to have bright, conspicuous colors. That's for the boys to catch the lady's eye, and then the girls need to blend in to take care of their babies. Um, and speaking of babies, someone would like to know, where do loons lay eggs since they're not able to walk on land? 
Yeah, so they still, they can't lay their eggs in the water. Um, they're not like a frog or anything like that that can have eggs in the water. So they can't walk very far on land. A lot of loon nests are actually out on little peninsulas or islands that jet out into the water so that they can just get up on the edge enough to lay their eggs. So they're not gonna go um, very far from the water at all um, because they can't walk well on land. So they're gonna go very close to the water's edge or even on a floating area in the water um, to lay their nest where they're safe in their water environment where they're fastest and uh, scariest <laughs> to protect their babies. That's great. And then another question is, what kind of birds are mating for life? Yeah, so there are a lot of different species of birds that actually pair up for life. Um, loons are one of them. So they make a, um, when they find their mate, they're going to stay with that same mate and that same mate is going to stay with them and um, help them raise their babies and um, come back year after year. So I know I talked about penguins, even though we don't have penguins in Maine, but they're another one that's going to form that very close um, bond and stay together forever. Um, but loons are one that you'll see here in Maine in the lake. You often see a pair and in a couple of weeks um, might even see some little fluffy baby loons with that pair. And this might be a tough one to figure out, but what bird has the sharpest beak? That is probably tough to figure out because um, sharp can mean different things. So there's some that have those really pointed beaks. Like I had this loon here with a very pointed beak. But then when we look at the sharp shinned hawk, it also has a very sharp hooked beak. So they're super different. They look very, very different from each other in size and shape and everything, but they're both really sharp. So it is kind of a tricky question because there are a lot of different, very sharp beaks that look very different from each other for different diets, so. And then another one that might be a little bit tricky to compare is uh, um, what is the most territorial bird of all the different ones we've talked about today? I don't know which would be most territorial. I know that from my own experience, um, if I'm out on a walk or I'm out on a hike, I notice that the red winged blackbirds are very territorial. Um, I have I saw a couple weeks ago a red winged blackbird um, trying to get a bird that looked almost three times its size away from its area and it was really attacking it kind of aggressively. So I think that they are one of the bolder, um, feistier birds that's really gonna, when they find their spot, hold their ground uh, very well. Yeah, these are also really great questions. And, and to add on to that, loons are also incredibly territorial. Um, as we've learned recently, um, there's a lot of different ways loons defend themselves, their beak being the, the biggest one, but uh, that's a, those are some great questions. And speaking of loons, do loons drink water? So every animal needs water to live. Um, they are going to be drinking water. So it's just um, like I was saying about their diet, that when they eat a fish or something, they don't want to, they want to get mostly fish and not very much water. So they're still drinking water to stay alive. They need water to stay alive, um, but they have special adaptations so that they're able to get their food without swallowing all the water when they're swimming and diving and everything. And another question, so where do loons live in the winter when the lakes and ponds are all frozen over? Yeah, so a lot of birds, um, they will migrate. So loons can fly. So they'll go somewhere a little bit warmer and less frozen um, when their habitat becomes frozen over. And there are a lot of different migratory bird species um, that come and go from Maine every year. And another question was about cardinals and if cardinals mate for life. I don't know if cardinals mate for life. I'm not sure, that would be one I'd have to look at um, to see if that specific bird does or not. Yeah, um, it seems from what, we, um, what we've been able to find out is cardinals do mate for life. 
So that's another one to add to the list along with all those other wonderful uh, birds. Yeah. Um, and then someone would like to know, do you know any interesting or fun facts about blue jays? I know that blue jays are another very ter territorial and very chatty bird. Um, I think that's one of the most fun facts I know is that they are also very aggressive and very territorial. Um, yeah, if you know any fun facts about blue jays, I would love to hear your fun facts about blue jays. can add it to my repertoire. Well, one of the things I know about uh, blue jays is uh, being in the corvid family with the crows and the ravens. They're very smart and they will often also prey on other animals like um, bird nests. Um, they really like to eat eggs sometimes. Um, so they're not a bird of prey, but they are like crows and will sometimes have a diverse diet. All right, we're gonna do um, one more question here. Um, what kind of fish do loons eat? Yeah, so they'll eat anything um, in those lakes and ponds. So they're gonna be eating freshwater fish. Um, they're not really a coastal bird. So they're gonna be in the freshwater and eating freshwater fish. Um, and again, like this is an adult loon. So it's not going to eat a, bur a fish that's like huge, like a really big bass or something like that. Um, but they do still have a pretty large mouth. So they're going to be able to like spear and grab a good sized fish. Um, so especially right now in the spring when a lot of the fish are spawning, it has to be just a loon feeding frenzy for some of those smaller fish. Yeah, a loon can eat about like any fish that they can swallow whole and kind of get down mm -hmm. and to their, their throat pouch when they're eating. So they have a wide uh, variety of options, whether they're on their wintering grounds, um, off towards the coastline, or if they're on their uh, freshwater um, ponds in the summertime. Um, and one other question, what is the most colorful bird? And uh, I'm not sure I know that one either. I know, I, I always think about the peacock. Um, which again is one of those examples. So peahens, the female um, of the species is a very like neutral brown colors. Um, and the male has these super bright eye um, patterns on their tail feathers. And even other than these feathers, all their feathers are very um, iridescent. So I think seeing that bright color and iridescence on a lot of bird feathers uh, makes them really pop and stand out and have extra flashy colors. So these are all some really great questions. If you do have more questions, um, please feel free to send them to us after this um, webinar is over. We'd be happy to try to find the answers. And I think I see one of the crows behind you. It's right towards the top. But, but uh, yeah, part I of definitely it. <laughs> just heard just heard the crow call out. That was a perfect crow call. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all so much for joining us and we hope to see you for our next um, presentation. We have them every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, so thank you for coming. And if you wanna find out more um, about these tours or things to do at home, um, you can go to mefishedwildlife.com and find more resources and more virtual tours. So thank you all again and have a good day. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate you tuning in. And if you wanna learn more about um, Maine's wildlife, you can visit us at mefishwildlife.com. And to learn more about these virtual field trips, you can visit us at mefishwildlife.com backslash field trips.